We suffer, but we don't discern suffering. It's an important distinction. Suffering is something we all know very directly. It's one of the most direct experiences in the mind. It comes before thought. But we don't really discern it because we're not looking at it very directly. We're off looking someplace else. In particular, there's one per form of suffering that's very important to look at. It's the suffering we're causing ourselves. We're more interested in the suffering that's coming from other people. The things they say, the things they do, their attitude towards us. It gets us all worked up. And because we're paying attention outside, we don't see what's going on inside. And so we end up paying attention to things that we can change a little bit, but can't change all that much. And we ignore the big thing that we do have the power to change. Which is how we react to feelings of pleasure and pain. And how craving builds on top of that. And from our craving we create all kinds of thought constructs and ideas that lead to suffering. So that's what we've got to look at. Just learning to focus there, that's the first, that's the first factor of what they call appropriate attention. Seeing right exactly where is the suffering that you're causing yourself through your craving and clinging. It's there. It's there all the time. Simply that you're not looking there, you're looking someplace else. But learning to look there and see that is important. That's the beginning of right view. It's the beginning of the path. It's what's going to help you discern the suffering. The Buddha said that right view is caused by two things, or is sparked by two things. One is hearing someone else talk about it, and the other is looking at things in an appropriate way, i.e. looking to see where are you causing yourself stress and suffering through your craving. There are three kinds of craving that are important. The Buddha doesn't put all kinds of desire under the heading of the cause of suffering. There's actually the desire that's part of right effort, which is part of the path. That's something you've got to develop. But craving for sensuality, craving to be this, that, or the other thing, or craving once a particular state of being has been set up, craving to have it destroyed. Those are the three kinds of craving that cause suffering. Now you can learn about that by hearing about it, and you can think about it to see where it makes sense. But the discernment that's actually going to cut through the cause, that's something you have to develop. You work on it. It's something you do. Because many times you can hear something and understand it and think about it and your thoughts are reasonable. But when you actually try to apply what you've thought through, it doesn't work. What you thought you know you didn't know clearly enough or precisely enough, or you didn't have a sense of the right time and place. This is a big factor in the practice knowing what things to focus on, what things to develop, what things to let go. The Buddha said there are four tasks connected with this whole problem of suffering. One is the suffering itself, the stress itself. That's something you try to comprehend, particularly see where the clinging is in the suffering. Once you see the clinging, then you can see the craving on which it's based. That's something you want to let go of. As for the path, you try to develop it and you give rise to it. And it's in the process of giving rise to it that you really develop your insight. Because if you're dealing in abstractions and thoughts and words, it's not necessarily the case that you've understood them properly. 
this whole problem of having right, right opinions. The word ditti in Pali means both view and opinion. And your opinions may be very right, but it may not be the time to talk about them. This is where it's important to have a sense of time and place. And how do you learn that? You learn that through trial and error. And how do you learn from trial and error? You have to be observant. Even though your views may be right, if you talk about them at the wrong time or try to impose them on other people, that's wrong. Remember, right view is a tool. And you don't go around carrying your saws and your hammers and your screwdrivers with you all the time. You put them in the tool chest. When you need them, then you bring them out. You use them, then you put them back in. Even though your even though your screwdriver may be a perfectly good screwdriver, if you need a saw, you bring out your screwdriver, you've done the wrong thing. So here we're working on the path. We're trying to give rise to right concentration as we focus on the breath. And there are times when that requires that you do a lot of thinking and evaluation, and other times when it requires nothing of that sort at all. So you have to be very quiet, very still, very uninvolved. Just watch what's coming up. And how do you know which time is which? Trial and error. You have to be observant. See what's the proper time for analysis. What's the proper time for stillness? The Buddha gives an analogy of trying to build a fire. Sometimes the fire is too big for your, your task, so you've got to learn how to dampen it down. Other times it's not enough, in which case you've got to learn how to build up the fire. It's the same with the factors of awakening. Some of the factors of awakening are energizing, analysis of what's going on in the present moment. Persistence, rapture, these are very energizing factors. And if your mind is already scattered, it doesn't help to just add more of these things. In other words, the fire is already too strong and you just keep pouring more and more fuel onto the fire. It gets worse. The more, that's when you need the more calming factors, tranquility, serenity, concentration, equanimity. Learn how to dampen the fire a little bit so it's just right for what you need it. On the other hand, if the fire is, looks like it's dying out, you need to add more of the active qualities. As for learning what kind of fire is just right, you can listen to other people explain the idea, but you've got to learn how to apply your own powers of observation. The Buddha always puts the onus on us. He says he just simply points the way. The application of his teaching, learning which teaching applies at which time, this is something we have to figure out on our own, by actually doing it. That requires that you have to be the sort of person who's willing to admit mistakes. <laughs> if you can't admit mistakes, then you never learn. Of course, you don't stop with admitting mistakes, and the next step is to try to figure out what you did wrong. And take that as a lesson. Try it again the next time. Keep perfecting, keep refining your understanding through developing these qualities of mind. Virtue, concentration, discernment. Mindfulness, the Buddha said, is always appropriate. Mindfulness and alertness. But as for whether the mind needs energizing or whether it needs calming down, you use a mindfulness and alertness to figure that out. And then apply what's ever appropriate. And in this way, your right view, your discernment gets refined through practice, through developing it. The path is something you do, it's something you work on. And it's your ability to look at what you're doing, see when it's working, see when it's not, and make the appropriate adjustments. That's what enables the path to develop. That's what enables it to grow. 
and to provide the, the results you want. There's a passage in the canon that talks about the, the factors that help right view yield its fruit in terms of release for the mind. There are five factors altogether. One is virtue. You actually observe the precepts. Look at the way you act. Look at the way you speak. Try to be more and more skillful in those things. That fosters right view. Listen and learn. Read. That's another factor. Discuss what you've listened in order to make sure that your understanding is right. And then the two factors of tranquility and insight. As you develop these, you bring the mind to concentration. As you, the mind gets into good, deep concentration, your tranquility and insight can do more refined work. This is when you really learn how to discern suffering, even on very subtle levels. The more advanced stages of insight, when they're talking about emptiness, basically comes down to this ability to get the mind into a good state of concentration deal with all the blatant levels of suffering and stress, you can finally get the mind to settle down with a sense of ease and rapture, and then begin to notice why it's still stressful there, and see what you're doing to cause it. Let go of what you're doing that's causing it, and the mind goes to deeper and deeper levels of concentration. So it all comes down to the ability to look at what you're doing to see where it's not quite right yet, to where it needs improvement, and then be willing and happy to do the improvement. As the Buddha said, part of the customs of the Noble Ones is to delight in developing. Whatever is needed to develop the path, you take a delight in doing that. It tends to reverse our normal allegiances. We tend to delight in whatever we like. But the Buddha says to delight in developing, in other words, working at this path. That takes a whole rearrangement of your attitudes. But without that rearrangement, the path just doesn't get developed. Learn to delight in letting go. Whatever it is you're doing that's causing suffering, being willing to admit it, learn to stop. That's how the path yields its fruits.